Welcome to the 11th webinar in the COVID-19 Ask the Experts webinar series. This webinar will address responding to death in the COVID-19 context, guidelines for administrators and crisis teams. I'm Stacey Kalamara-Skalski, and I'm NAF's Director of Professional Policy and Practice, and I'll be your moderator for this webinar. The Ask the Experts webinar series is a collection of recorded webinars posted on the NAF website. These are designed to offer support to our school psychologists and students and interns uh, as they navigate the delivery of school psych services in response to the COVID pandemic. Each webinar is free and open to the public. At the conclusion of our webinar, a discussion thread will be opened on the NAS member exchange as a follow-up. In order to access or post questions or to that discussion, you will need to be a NAS member. But we do encourage you to take all of your comments and your questions to the NAS member exchange following this webinar. Each webinar will address critical questions emerging as a result of the need to provide virtual telehealth services. It'll offer some type of advice and guidance from experts and some suggested strategies and resources to help you along the way. Today, we have four expert panelists dealing with us or uh, offering their support today. Uh, first is Cindy Dickinson. She is the head of crisis response services for the Fairfax County Public Schools and co-lead for NAS National Crisis Response Team. She has coordinated crisis response for her large suburban school district for 19 years. Cindy is a prepare master trainer, active crisis responder, and disaster volunteer. She represents NAF as the American Red Cross Disaster Mental Health Liaison. Cindy has addressed critical incidents such as large-scale disasters, human cost tragedies, a suicide cluster, and the Virginia Tech shooting on behalf of her district. Secondly, we have Ben Fernandez. Ben works for Loudoun County Public Schools in Virginia as the lead school psychologist, providing leadership to school psychologists and a broad array of psychological and school-based mental health services, including assessment, consultation, counseling, prevention, and intervention. He's a member of NAS School Safety and Crisis Response Team. In 2012, he was named NAS School Psychologist of the Year. Ben earned his graduate degree in school psychology at Bucknell University in Pennsylvania. Thirdly, we have Kathy Kennedy Payne. Kathy is the lead for the National Association of School Psychologists National Crisis Response Team. She has been a crisis responder and crisis trainer for 30 years at the district, state, and national level. She is an adjunct faculty member at the University of Oregon and has spent her career as a teacher, school psychologist, and district special ed administrator. Kathy is a prepare master trainer and continues to publish resource articles related to school safety, crisis response, and trauma recovery. Lastly, we have Shane Jimerson. Shane is a professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara. His scholarship focuses on supporting and advancing the social, emotional, cognitive, and mental health development of children. Is an active scholar with over 400 publications, including many books and journal articles aimed at bringing science to practice to benefit children. He is also an active leader within NAS, APA Division 16, ISPA, CAF, SSSP, and currently is the editor-elect for School Psychology Review. Welcome to all of you, and thank you for taking your time and joining us today. All right. We will start our first question and direct it to Ben. Uh, ben, if you can unmute yourself. And um, I'm gonna just ask if you could tell us just a little bit about what types of crises are schools experiencing now? Yeah, um, you know, we're, we're definitely living in a, a very interesting time given the pandemic. And, and during this time, I think all schools are likely to be impacted in some way um, by the coronavirus or COVID-19. Um, schools are, are, are reports of, of students who, who are getting sick uh, from COVID-19 and, and the families are getting sick from COVID-19. Um, they're also getting reports of school staff um, getting sick. But in, in addition to that, you know, we're, we're, we're getting reports of um, families who are in, experiencing financial crises because of uh, the aftermath of, of COVID-19. Um, you know, parents are losing their jobs, their financial security 
um, is now um, a serious issue for some families and, you know, being able to have their basic needs um, met. Um, and then finally, um, you know, we schools are getting reports of uh, people who are, are dying related to the, the COVID-19 uh, virus. I think um, this is one of the most unfortunate things about the pandemic is that it's not just the disruption to our daily lives that's occurring, but it's really a life and death experience for so many people in, in so many different schools. And so it's that yeah. tragic response that today will certainly be our focus. Yeah. And, and, and at the same time, you know, schools are also experiencing um, crises that they would normally or typically experience during the typical school year. Um, you know, there have been schools that have been impacted by, by the suicides of students and, and adults in, in the community. Um, there have been violent deaths in, in communities, uh, dental deaths, um, and other medically related deaths that are not associated for um, COVID-19. So, you know, looking at it, it, the, at the time we live in, um, it, it's more important than ever that, that school crisis teams and, uh, are, are taking a look at um, how they're serving communities and adapting uh, their way to, to make sure that they can um, provide that support and deliver those interventions to those who need it. Good point, good point. Let's talk a little bit about um, deaths and how we respond to them. What are some of the challenges when responding to a death during this pandemic? Well, I, I think, you know, the, the, the biggest challenge uh, for crisis teams right now is that direct in-person response. Um, that, that direct in-person response at this time is just not possible given the, the various closures, uh, things like that. Um, in the past, uh, teams would be able to provide that direct in-person support for students at their schools. Um, and, and because of that, there were so many advantages. And you know, there's the um, you know, direct uh, evaluation of, of trauma risk, the direct delivery of intervention, face-to-face you know, -face delivery of intervention, and a number of other supports that being at a school are provided for crisis teams. Um, but now, given the distancing and the closure of schools, teams need to determine the best way to deliver virtual supports to their school community. Um, you know, it, it starts with, you know, really taking a, a look at what already exists, you know, what crisis team structures are, were there prior to the shutdown, what were the operations. Um, and looking at what elements and operations that could easily be adapted to a virtual response. You know, we really don't have to recreate the wheel or start from scratch when it comes to um, providing support uh, when, when there's a death in the community during this time. Um, the next thing I think teams need to take a look at is at examining um, existing communication tools uh, and, and making sure that any kind of communications that the crisis team is sending out or the school is sending out to the community that's impacted, um, that, that's, that, it, that they are accessible to, to families. You know, we want to make sure that there are methods to communicate with families where um, English is not the primary language. Uh, and we also want to account for um, families who have limited or no internet access. What are the uh, additional tools? What are the additional methods? Um, are available to reach out to, to those families to ensure that they have timely and, and accurate information. And then lastly, I, I think um, crisis teams should consider you know, team-specific communications, you know, what uh, that would allow for, for teams to, to respond uh, efficiently, to follow up efficiently, and for them to be notified uh, that they need it efficiently. Um, backup plans should be considered. Uh, for example, if, if um, team members are not able to participate through illness or other difficulties, you know, how are teams able to um, adapt to those changes? Um, and also considerations into how our crisis teams deploy during this virtual time. Um, also looking at intervention, um, looking at documentation. Those are all things that should be considered and, and, and thought about it this time. And then lastly, most importantly, 
it is team care, um, team care for the caregiver at this time. We're, we're all under a lot of pressure. We're all under a lot of stress. And, and crises in the school are definitely in the school community, uh, you know, additional stress that we, we have to manage. And so making sure we're taking care of each other, that we're taking care of ourselves is very important. So uh, really at the heart of what you're talking about is the importance of having a good, effective crisis team with a good plan in place um, and effective strategies for really supporting each other as well as the school community. Yep. All right. So let's uh, continue looking forward and maybe Shane um, can share a little bit uh, with us about how has this nature of crisis intervention actually changed during this time of physical distancing? What impact does it really have? Well, given the importance of physical distancing, as been noted, the focus of many school crisis response teams has switched from the previous emphasis largely on school-based intervention strategies and supports for students and staff to a focus on helping support the students and families within the community context. For instance, crisis interventions may provide remote or virtual mental health consultation that's available to parents and older students as part of the crisis intervention. It also is important to identify local policies and procedures regarding mental health services and telepsychology delivery. So consider, for instance, uh, county behavioral wellness offices, hospice professionals, and local mental health providers. In general, school crisis teams are thinking about how to facilitate those collaborations and communications. And within the current context, this is particularly important. There's detailed information regarding telehealth supports uh, that's available on the NASP COVID-19 Resource Center, and there's a link to that following our presentation within this slide deck. Also, as emphasized in the prepare book and the curriculum, the crisis intervention typically includes providing valuable resources and materials to help support students, staff, and parents. And within the context of physical distancing, it has been important to identify those resources within the community and also those available online to help meet the needs of students, staff, and faculty. So it's important to collaborate with these local community agencies, including law enforcement, hospitals, medical facilities, community mental health services, the Department of Health, et cetera, to assist with the coordination of services outside of the realm of the school building. For instance, uh, identifying local and national hotlines is a very valuable strategy. Also, identifying services for basic needs, such as housing, food, financial assistance, and such. And then also identifying local providers that offer teletherapy services. And electronic communications and resources are increasingly emphasized to share the materials that help provide important information that can be used to help caregivers support students. For instance, the NASP website offers many handouts and materials that are specifically developed to inform and empower caregivers. So many materials that are posted on the NASP website to address important topics related to COVID-19 are developed specifically for caregivers who will be engaged with students during the physical distancing. And these materials offer caregivers core knowledge as well as specific strategies to help support children. And during this time of physical distancing, these resources are particularly important to help provide this knowledge and empower the caregivers to support children in their homes. I think really important in your comments is how much we need to actually go and look at these resources and prepare for the possible eventualities that may arise um, as we deal with this um, pandemic. And with each week that goes by, a new surprise comes in the world of crisis um, intervention. And so uh, I really like what you're saying there, uh, Shane, about taking the time and going and looking through these resources now while we can. Um, let's take a look at the next question then. Um, and Shane, if you could answer this too, what are some key considerations following the crisis response? Yes, and in many ways, these are similar to what the key considerations would be for the school crisis team in general, even uh, outside of the context of the COVID-19. But after responding to the crisis, the team members should examine the effectiveness of the communications, the strategies, and the supports. 
uh, the reflections and the review of these response efforts should really ask three basic questions. For instance, what went well? What were challenges and how were they resolved? And then also, how can the team improve for the next response? And it's important to share the lessons learned with crisis team members and other relevant personnel in order to further improve the response efforts in the future. It is also important to complete further enhancements to the plans, to the protocols, and to the strategies to further enhance the future efforts. And then finally, follow-up and monitoring is also important to support students and families over time. So for instance, within the context of COVID-19, setting up scheduled email communications is one simple strategy that may be used during physical distancing to help facilitate the follow-up communications with students and families. Such emails may encourage students or caregivers to check, maybe check in via email, or they might provide information and updates or to contact crisis team, team members using other technologies such as teleconference or phone. And given the ongoing effects of crisis events and the impact on individuals and families, such follow-up and monitoring is often very important to meet the needs of students and caregivers. Excellent suggestions and recommendations. Um, let's go to Kathy. Kathy, we know that when a death does occur in school, it's pretty common for students and faculty to want to have some type of memorial um, set up on behalf of the, the actual victim. Um, and we know that memorials can be helpful to the recovery process. In this virtual world, how do you see them being used best? Well, we know that memorial activities um, allow the school community to express both their emotions and support for the family. And as you said, they can bring closure to the period of grieving for the staff and students. So our challenge today, of course, is to engage in those memorial activities while still practicing social distancing. Some type of memorial activities may not be possible during this time. As always, before proceeding with any of those activities, we'd want to consult with the family and the district policy about memorials. With modifications, many typical memorial activities and supports for the family can continue in this changing world of social distancing. You know, we can still draw and write memories of the person, create a video story, song, or poem as a remembrance to the family. We can create and share a set of the individual's pictures from their yearbook or school activities. We can share stories of ways in which the deceased touched the lives of others. And we can even institute a meal train for the family with food purchased from local restaurants rather than home prepared food. So how would these things happen while practicing social distancing? Here's some thoughts. We could upload the drawings or writings to the teacher through the daily distance learning platform that's already in place. We could post the product on a memorial website or create a delivery point at the school for a limited period of time where families can deposit remembrances such as cards, letters, and artwork. We could mail the products to the family through the school office and of course we can use social media. We recommend having an adult staff member as an advisor for younger students who wish to do that. One caution, staff should review the content of any material created for the family for appropriateness before it's sent home or posted. It's common for initial or spontaneous memorials to take place within about a week of a significant death. During the COVID-19 school closures, stay-at-home requirements probably make spontaneous memorials unlikely. So unless restrictions are lifted, students should not gather on the school property during this time. Any spontaneous memorial materials should be removed and saved for later for a display or given to the family, whatever's in keeping with the school's usual response. And memorials such as planting a tree or a garden, placing equipment on a school property, or providing anything permanent must be approved by the administrator and are not recommended during the COVID-19 school closures. However, planning for future memorials could occur via video calls. 
And we caution that any funds raised by community members on behalf of the students or families should be managed by a sponsoring group and not the school district. Memorials remain an important part of our recovery and schools will need to be creative to incorporate activities that can reasonably be done in this distance environment. We've included several documents with this webinar with details related to memorials, including diversity and cultural factors, fundraising and fund management, cautions when the death is the result of a suicide, and other memorial planning guidelines. That's really helpful um, information about memorials and how to respond to those. Um, let's talk just a little bit more then, Kathy, if we could, just about how, what the role of the school is um, in this place. So in the past, you know, schools provided sort of an ideal place for support after a crisis um, had occurred. How do you see schools providing ongoing support through this virtual environment? This really presents both a challenge and an opportunity for us. Uh, typically, the school psychologist or the counselor would, of course, be there in person and could check in with the students and staff to provide the support. And now, of course, we can't do that so easily. We need to figure out how to observe our social distancing and stay-at-home requirements while still responding. And there are some things we can do. First, we want to encourage those that are affected by the death to continue to make connections with their naturally occurring social supports. So family members in the household, other relatives or friends. Some of these connections will be in person and others of course may be FaceTime or Zoom conversations, depending on the restrictions in place. When possible, school psychologists and counselors can continue to connect virtually with their students and families and staff members who have close connections to the deceased or those that have other significant risk factors. This can and should be done using the direct district approved platform for contacting families. It'll be important for, to document all contacts and coping strategies in case follow-up is needed at a later time. We recognize that teachers will be the primary contacts for most students during this distance learning. And so we will need to provide classroom teachers with information to assist them in supporting their students following a death and to help them recognize when affected students need outside mental health services. So here's some things that teachers can do. Make a check and connect virtual contact. So here the teacher would briefly assess how the student is coping by a phone or a video chat. Provide strategies for coping. The teacher can give the student specific ideas for coping with their loss. Provide positive messages that convey hope and caring. You know, teachers are already quite good at this. And teachers can help recognize signs that the student needs further mental health support and ask the school psychologist or counselor to provide referral information for the family. Finally, it's important to designate a lead mental health person from the crisis team to follow up periodically with the teachers for the most highly affected students. This mental health lead can facilitate access to outside support if needed. As with our traditional face-to-face -face support, you know, there's not really one strategy that fits everyone. So the crisis team is gonna continually need to receive information from the teachers and adjust to meet the needs of all the students and staff members. Excellent, those are just fantastic strategies. I'm so appreciative to the School Safety and Crisis Response Team for putting together all these materials and these strategies and really um, taking us through them so that they're applicable and we can really you know, use them in our daily work. Uh, let's take a, a minute and actually we're gonna transition to Cindy and Cindy, if maybe you can talk to us about some of these resources for crisis response that are available um, on the website. Okay, thank you, Stacy. I just wanted to lead people through what I hope it makes this process of working in a virtual crisis response mode more efficient, given the fact that we are now working in various environments and platforms, Google, Blackboard, Zoom, and so forth, and we're not seeing people face-to-face, -face, including our crisis team members, 
need to find the most effective ways to reach each other, confer, and to address any ongoing concerns. So included in our resources are suggested contact methods. I've, I've found myself in my large district that having text message groups is more helpful than trying to send email, which is a for method of communication if you need to respond. So that is one suggestion. And uh, as many people are meeting virtually and have to set up scheduled meetings in order to confer about something. So getting something to people quickly does help. Uh, additionally, we're thinking about the ways that we can track us for support and related actions. After a crisis occurs and we've communicated the information to, let's say, our group, our crisis team, and confirm the facts, we have an obligation to get together and talk about the incident and the potential impact it will have on individuals within the school and also the families we serve. So we need to collect that information. And as we talk, we are conducting a form of triage, which is really essential. As we've worked in this COVID-19 arena recently in my district, we've often included and always included when possible classroom teacher or teachers who might have worked with the student and or if it were was a teacher loss, uh, certainly close colleagues, if possible, administrators and so forth. But ultimately, we're going to be putting out an offer of support and technically it might be via an electronic letter or some form of communication to parents to e notify where I'm located. But we're going to offer some type of support and we need to find out who needs it the most. The team might identify a number of students they'd be concerned about, let's say if one of their fellow students has died, no matter what the cause, and we will identify them and put them on the triage sheet. But more important, we, we extend an offer to parents to reach back to us via email or a survey or whatever simple electronic means we can come up with to say, I need a consultation. So first of all, we have attached to our uh, toolkit an Excel spreadsheet that is totally adaptable, fillable, and useful for the triage process that enables the crisis team to share the resources, list the students or parents who might need to be reached or who were reached, the status of each contact, uh, any connection to in terms of proximity issues to the discussion best friend or saw the incident and so forth, what types of resources or supports were offered, and is there a follow-up needed, as in we need to connect the child or the family to a provider outside of the school, or are we going to need an important check-in within a week and so forth. That particular tracking sheet can then be saved and shared with the administrator and the local crisis team so that they will have a plan for returning to learning, hopefully in the near future. Additionally, I offered in the handout a method of phone consultation guidance, which is modified from something we use in our during the summertime. And that's uh, an opportunity for parents a 30 minute, up to 30 minute consultation with a school mental health provider. We would extend offers of this type. Parents would merely reach the school and say, I would like to talk with a school mental health provider about the impact this event has had on my child. And we would set up an appointment and we would do a follow up with that parent or caregiver. And in addition, we would offer that for older students. Some students, including high school students and older middle school students, might want to take advantage of the opportunity to speak to their school mental health team or a member of that team. It could be their school counselor they're connected to, their school psychologist, school social worker in my district, 
and uh, we would give them that opportunity as well to submit a request for such an appointment. A number of cautions around that second one when there's a student requesting that kind of support. We need parents to be completely knowledgeable that they are making that request for, let's say, telehealth or telehealth consultation with one of us because if students disclose something that puts them at risk for some form of harmful behavior, as in negative coping and poor coping strategies in general, we may need to follow up immediately at, after that consultation with the parent to say, it's important that we speak with your provider or make sure that your child gets direct assistance. So that cautionary part is also included in our guidance. Uh, next slide, please, Stacy. I'll keep going. In addition, we have included in our tools some sample letters. At, at the time of a crisis, it's often difficult for people to know what to say or how to convey the difficult news. Now that we're probably doing that electronically, we've given you some words to get started. Of course, that needs to align with any school district policy uh, on sharing information. And that inf information is really vital so that our parents and caregivers get the information as soon as they can and to have verified facts when we do share that information. As a matter of procedure, we will not likely be disclosing that someone uh, had a death by a certain disease process. As it's well known, uh, that's something that my district is very cautious about. And so please um, take a look at what your district requires in terms of sharing that type of information and mind that let's say it was a COVID-19 related loss, uh, that that can have a, a very large ripple effect on your school district and the parents who received the information. Additionally, on the website and in the tool, we have um, indicated a number of crisis specific resources related to grief, uh, suicide, and so forth. There is, that was uh, earlier, uh, developed the, a care for the caregiver training, a tier one strategy that could be utilized in a virtual environment. That is available because NAS um, leaders have provided that for you. Number of coping with COVID-19 crisis tips. And of course, for those who are prepared trained, there are a number of curriculum handouts that pertain to addressing any crisis. And I recommend <clears throat> to look at those. Thank you so much for all of those resources and for the information, um, the tips for how to use them. All of it is valuable to us at this time. So in summary, uh, for this particular webinar, we just wanna again say, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic, it's an ever evolving crisis situation for individuals, for teachers, for schools, for families. Um, it's causing a huge amount of stress for people. We all experience that personally and we experience that collectively in our work together. Um, one of the things that's important is that we remember that in situations like this, recovery takes time. It doesn't happen in any kind of sequential or linear fashion. Uh, we generally move through the stages of grief and loss in the same way, um, you know, that we uh, would in other situations, but they happen at different times. They're, they affect individuals in different ways. And so keeping in mind that um, there are all different responses going on uh, at one time is really important. Uh, there are different steps that school leaders and crisis team members can take to foster the well-being and the health of their students and their faculty. Uh, we encourage schools to really think about the caregiver and how we can care for the caregiver and how the caregiver can work care for themselves. Uh, really taking the time for self-care is essential at this time um, and in this response. Uh, we can't emphasize enough the importance of being personally aware and balanced and connected to one another 
even at this time of social distancing or spatial distancing, we really don't want to engage as much in social distancing. We want to stay connected to one another. We want our relationships uh, to be sound and to exercise the same levels of care that we would if we were meeting with each other face to face. Take time and celebrate in your communities the small achievements, uh, the work that you're doing together, the support that you are providing. And in the event that you find yourself in difficult situations, really needing the support of others, don't ever hesitate to seek help um, for yourself or for others in your system. Uh, as our speakers have mentioned, we refer you to the NASP COVID Resource Center. Um, as with all of our webinars, we've tried to provide a link to the, the important um, strategies and resources and materials that we think will be helpful to you in this work. Um, as Cindy mentioned, there is a special responding to death in the COVID-19 context handout that's been designed for you that's specific to the topic of this webinar. We refer you there, as well as the many adapted resources um, that um, our presenters have talked about today. Um, please take your time, uh, download the PowerPoint presentation so that you can click on these links directly from your computer and um, mine the wonderful, wonderful materials that are here and the resources that they provide. And um, we also did link to you, for you one external resource we thought might be helpful, the After Suicide Toolkit. Um, this particular toolkit can help you in the event that a tragedy such as a suicide occurs. I want to take this moment to just thank our experts again who took time to share with us today. Thank you all very much for all of your thoughtful comments and guidance. Uh, we thank all of you who are listening to this webinar today, and as always, we wish you safe and healthy days ahead.